Whoa. Hello. <laughs> Let, let me start us off by saying it is really a personal honor for me to be on stage with the three of you. We're here to discuss building billion dollar European businesses, and I can't think of better people to do it with. We have Magnus and Mons, CEOs and chairman of billion dollar companies, started in Sweden, expanded to all of Europe, iZettle and ClickTech for those that were less familiar and Laurel, who has invested in multiple billion dollar European companies, including iZettle, ClickTech, Just Eat, Hybris, and Salonis. And those are just the European billion dollar companies she's invested in. So shall we start? Magnus and Mons, can you kick us off by talking about what you think some of the key success factors are in building your respective companies? Magnus, do you want to start us off? Yeah, well, I think... Uh uh, when when uh, Jacob, my co-founder, and I started iSettle, I think we, we thought a lot about a number of different things. You know, we thought about uh, how well technology that we were going to apply would scale. We thought about uh, distribution, how would that scale so that we could really grow quickly. And actually, we spent quite some time all zone culture mm. Mm. and how that would scale across different mm -hmm. markets in the world. So I think all of those are were critical things that we really try to yeah, understand before we launched our, our, our yeah. products. Mons, was that similar for you with ClickTech, or maybe there were other points? Yeah, absolutely. I always uh, think of it as, uh, as being uh, four pillars, where the first one is really understanding your market. In, a, in our case, we discovered that our competitors at the time were only pursuing a small piece of the market, which at the time was considered to be a five or six billion dollar market growing 15% annually. And we realized that the opportunity was probably several hundred mm. billion dollars. So that's the first pillar, really understanding what you do and uh, how you are uniquely positioned to pursue that opportunity. And then the three others are kind of natural after that because the, uh, I mean, the next thing would be to, to build a solid go-to-market model. The uh, build out your, your organization, and for me, something that's very, very important is, um, is, uh, is building the culture and values in the company. Mm, culture seems to be an interesting last but very important criteria both of you have. Is there a bit more you want to say about what the key, key cultural components were that helped drive the success? Well, I, I, you know, maybe sound a bit easy in some ways. You know, everybody speaks about culture and how yeah. important it is. Uh, and I think for us, you know, we've tried to iterate many times as to what are really the values that we stand for. And we, you know, we're looking to democratize financial services for small businesses. And, and how can we do that? And how can we, so we created sort of three key components, which was easy, reliable, inspiring, mm -hmm. which, you know, anyone could, could have that. So, that it's, it's about how you fill that with meaning and, and live with that, mm. you know, and, and, and very small things like uh, when you come to our office, we've tried to say that it should be like, you know, a home away from home. So what does that mean? So it means that you have music and candle lights when you actually come in in the morning, which is quite nice, especially this time of the year. But more importantly, so when I walk down the corridor in our office, Sometimes you find things, papers and stiff stuff lying on the floor. Yeah. And you yeah. could stand there and you could see 50 people walking by not doing anything. But if it was at home, they would pick it up. Yeah. So I make a point of always doing that. You know, that's just a very small example of living the culture. Small but big. Yeah. Laura, I'm going to pull you into this. 83 North, your firm has invested in $8 billion businesses. What do you think has enabled your firm to do this? Your secret sauce, if you say, if you mind sharing. And what perspective did that give you so that when you met Magnus and Mons, you saw the potential for what they could be? Um, I think one of the first things that differentiates us, um, we, we don't do a lot of investments, probably about one per partner per year. Um, and when you, you know, when you can, when you, with that in mind, you can end up being you know, very selective mm. um, when you don't have a gun to your head to deploy capital um, and that you don't have any incentive to deploy capital either. Um, and I often wonder, you know, if we gave all the VCs, all the partners and said, you can only do 15 investments in your life, you know, I think that might change the way you approach investing. Um, I think the, 
you know, the second thing, because we don't do a lot of investments, we end up building very strong relationships with our founders. You know, two of them sitting here. Two great examples. Um, many of them become advisors to our fund. Don't worry, Magnus, we just got your <laughs> offer soon. Um, and, um, and so that becomes sort of a critical source of deals for us. Um, so I think that's one of the key differentiators. And then on talking about the companies, I think, look, to start with ClickTech, um, you know, I agree with Munz. We thought the market was enormous. We really liked the way that Munz and his team had turned around the company, because ClickTech had been around for a long time and going nowhere before Munz found the company. Um, and then we thought we could help them quite a lot with US expansion. Um, and then with Magnus and, and Jacob at Izetel, um, actually that deal, you know, just co to contradict myself, didn't come through any of our networks, where, which was unlike ClickTech. In fact, we had done quite a bit of research on payments and, and came across Izetel. And what we liked about them, um, you know, we thought, firstly, we liked the mix of execution experience and product experience between Jacob and, and Magnus. We thought the market was very big. We were very worried about competition, mm -hmm. um, which later, you know, became a, it did become a real issue. Um, um, yeah, and just thought that, you know, they would execute and would win the market, which I think they, you know, that the, the, the show is still on, but it's definitely turned out to be true. Yeah. Well, let's talk about tough times, because it's always, you know, when, when the, what's that statement? When the waters are rising, all ships go up or something. But when it's, when it's hard, right? Let's talk about times there were challenges in the business, and then how do you work with your investors? I'm sure lots of folks in the audience are, are worried if things get tough, investors run away. So, Mons, maybe you can start us off by sharing some challenges you had and potentially there were some interactions with investors that would be yeah, illustrated. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, for me, the, the, the most challenging time in the company was uh, actually right after I invested, which was in the beginning of 2000. 2000. And um, I got on the board only to realize that the founders of the company had really cheated us Ooh. when they presented the company. So, uh, so it, was, uh, it was very much of a train wreck, honestly. So I had to st step in and become the CEO only three months after I invested in the company to try to turn the company around, which was completely unplanned. And, uh, and I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for it. This was the, time, this was the first time for me th to become a CEO. And uh, I had no formal training, no education whatsoever to prepare me for that. I just happened to stand in the room when we took the decision <laughs> to, to replace the, uh, the current CEO. And uh, you know, for those of you who were, who were around in two, 2000, you probably remember that that was the year when the so-called IT bubble burst. Mm -hmm. So I became the CEO in May. The, uh, the bubble burst over the summer and the, the market was completely drained of capital, and we were running towards bankruptcy uh, in an amazing, amazing speed. So uh, that was obviously very tough. Uh, one of the first things I had to do in the company was to call the local bank and tell him that the credit they had given the company couldn't be repaid, uh, so we had to meet. Uh, after a few months, uh, we also worked with funding, by the way, and we were, we were fortunate enough to have, to have angels that uh, trusted us and supported us, uh, which was a blessing. But, um, but uh, after a couple of months, I also had to, uh, to downsize the organization, which it's hard. is not my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Magnus, I'm sure. There's some learnings there you can share with the audience, and maybe yeah, maybe yeah. Um, times when Laurel was involved as well. I mean, you know, it, well. it, it comes with with um, with lack of, of, of funds. Basically, that's what's just threatening you all the time. You know, you make mm. plans, and very often you hit cost dead on, and revenues are failing in one way or another. And in our case, there are two instances. One was an external, uh, just after Laurel invested, actually, uh, where where Visa Europe uh, actually pulled the plug on us and we lost 75% of our revenues in all countries except Sweden. That was uh, a, a very, very difficult time, both you know, facing investors and, 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 and uh, just getting to terms with what do we do now to, yeah. and really, you know, in a way, billions of dollars disappeared in valuation, potential valuation for the company because we had to change everything, business model, uh, the, the, the hardware we were providing, so it was incredibly tough times for us. Even if we had funds, you know, yeah. it was 
it was uh, dreadful, actually. Is there something you want to share, Laurel, about your memory of that time, about how does as an entrepreneur and an investor work together to get through those kind of rough patches? Yeah, actually, I remember that very clearly. Um, we closed the investment, and you know, maybe I don't know how other investors feel, but normally when I, when I close an investment, I am literally terrified. <laughs> um, and as much as I'm happy to do the investment or happy to have won it, it's, it's frightening. You, you know, you're signing away other people's money. So you always have the sense. Um, and in this case, actually, I had some of Munster's money exactly. as well as my <laughs> funds. And um, so we closed the investment. You've got this mix of happiness and, and worry. And literally a week later, Magnus calls me and says, look, we've got some bad news. We're shutting down the UK, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and we're not going anywhere else. We're staying to Sweden. And um, I have to say, it was pretty terrifying. I had to then, probably a couple of months later, go and report to my investors. Um, at my LP meeting as to this, why we invested in the company and what had then happened. But I think that's, you know, if I look back in my history of investing, you know, resilience of founders and, and, and passion of founders and um, desire to find a way forward, you know, that's sort of the thing that marks the kind of people I think we've invested in. And, um, you know, it's been an honor, I guess, to work with people who always find a way and um, always find their roots through a hard time and, and you know, reinvent the company, um, stabilize things and move forward. And of course, that's exactly what they did. Um, uh, Apparently built a, so. Built a new yeah. chip and um, you know, found new markets and solved the problems with Visa. Yeah. Interesting. But I think it deserves to be said that many of the most successful companies has actually had at least one near-death experience. So, and I think that there's something about that really strengthens you. So you go, f go through that, uh, you know, sometimes with the organization, and it just sharpens the mind. I'm sure. Any other particular points that you remember that were that eye or mind sharpening? Hmm. Well, there was one other event when, um, I guess, a few months after you invested, or maybe a year after you invested, I was about to miss the, the fourth quarter of, of that year. And uh, we were sitting in the boardroom in, in Lund, where we had a headquarter at the time, and, uh, and had a, a very, very tough discussion. And uh, one of the board members in particular was extremely tough with me. I don't, don't know if you remember oh, that. I do. So, and I was uh, completely shook up. And, uh, and after the board meeting, and people could hear, people in the organization could hear how they were yelling at me in the room, which of course is a bad thing <laughs> for me. So after the board meeting, uh, I went out to, to the office and had a kind of a town hall meeting. I stood on a chair and said, you guys have to help me now because uh, we're significantly, significantly behind and uh, I need your help to pull in everything we've got so we make the quarter. And uh, the miracle happened. <laughs> wow. I so, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's something that comes with strong culture. I, 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 I cannot emphasize the importance of culture enough. Mm. So if people go there because it's fun, uh, you have a, you know, a, a serious sense of uh, belonging to a team, uh, people, you know, really like working for the company and so on. That's going to show when you have tough times. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. when you uh, and you will you will see if they stand up for you when the times are tough. Mm -hmm. Then you know you have a good culture. Mm -hmm. Well, I if you were that, to yeah. um, go on, no, I, th I think that that you know, and also what we've experienced in IZ as we've grown is that you know it becomes more and more important. You know, and you need to. F because you want to be nimble and fast and flexible and, and, and then you know as you, as you become bigger you need processes and things that slow you down and, and sort of you know you, you risk losing the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. feeling in the company. So that's you know and I, I remember giving a speech about that at our first summer party and everybody looked at me and didn't say what is he talking about you know this is not going on at Izettel. But now they understand that we need to fight every day. And when yeah. we have introductions for new employees, you know, that's one, the one thing I tell them is, it's your responsibility to challenge your manager. And they, it will not happen automatically. You need to have courage. Nothing bad will happen. Mm. And that is, is incredibly important if you want to keep the vitality also when you get a bit bigger. Interesting. Laurel, what advice would you add to their, their shared from the investor perspective? about what CEOs and founders could think about in general or potentially when raising capital, if the advice changes at all? Um, well, just related to um, a couple of points that they said, I think um, 
you know, when companies are moving to the US, and, and many of you will know this, I think it's critically important that a founder, at least one of the founder moves. Um, and really important for culture to set the culture in the US office. I think what we've also often done is move some more junior employees, but employees that really embody the culture to the US. And actually in one case, um, which I thought worked fantastically well, we took a guy that was um, just an outstanding business development um, guy in our, in our German office, took him across with the CEO and wrenched him out of this role and made him head of people. Um, and we did it only for 18 months, but it was just brilliant because he, you know, he interviewed everybody, he hired everybody, he talked to everybody, and um, you know about the culture and about the organisation. Of course, when he was in the US, you know, he had easy access back to the office in Germany. So I think that was, you know, that 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 made a lot of sense. Um, the, the the other point about hiring and and culture, I I really think that sometimes you know, both, actually both investors and founders like to think they see these fantastic VP, SVP sales, et cetera, in the US um, and often want to hire them, um, people with tons of experience. Actually, we've, we've had a lot more success in hiring younger, very smart, very driven, very motivated people who want to grow a lot. Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I would advise anybody moving across geographies to think about that rather than to think, well, I've got to have, I'm moving from France to Germany and therefore I need a very experienced German person. I'm not sure you do. Um, and then, you know, just I think, you know, like we've talked, most companies have ups and downs. So I think you just want to make sure that your investor you choose has gone through some of those ups and downs. Um, because, um, you know, I had a company call me the other day, I w won't say where it was, but there was some issue around um, actually fraud in the company. And I think, in the end, the, the, the CEO said to me, oh, the best thing was that you guys remained completely calm, helped us to solve the problem as opposed to you know, panicking. We could have panicked. If I told you what it was about, you would probably start panicking. So I think that's, that would be the other yeah, piece of advice. Let me stay on this, this um, a bit of topic about, of talking about some of the experiences you've had investing in companies in different geographies. So you invest in Israeli and European companies along with US. What do you think sets apart the Israeli and European companies? And Magnus Amman, she's essentially talking about you, so feel free to chime in afterwards. Um, so they're, they're both Swedish, I, not Israeli, but still they, but still. they probably have a view. But, um, but, um, but Israel um, and I know European you know being that. separate from, um, um, from the US. Look, I think the, the, the key thing is, of course, you, you know, the Israeli and US companies, especially if they're software, um, so it was less in the case of Magnus, but they have to go um, to other geographies and often to the US. And I think um, that's tough. It's tough from all the things they've talked about, culture, it's disruptive, but I think it makes you very resilient. It makes you, you know, when you do need to then go to Asia, in a way easier. Um, um, I think in Europe, one of the differences is, you know, you, you can, um, you know, you, Europe can be its own market. So, mm. you know, we invested in, in Just Eat, in Isethel, and both of them never needed to go to the US. They, could, they had to go to multiple European countries, um, to some of the South American ones, but they never needed to go to the US. So I think you can build you know, very big companies in your own right, mm -hmm. you know, coming out of Europe. I, I'm obviously, you know, if, you have, if you look at a US company, they have a huge home market. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you, when you want to expand the European company, you, you need to be, in some ways, you need to be smarter. You know? How can you find ways to scale across countries and and I think at least for us you know we we uh, you know people tend to think about if we go into France or we're going to Germany but what we have found is that the key is really not to go to think like that but rather think you know take a city or even part of a hmm. city and build that and then that will start to expand and as you and then you go to the next city and over and after a while you have a country but but uh, otherwise you will spend so much money uh, before you understand how to go, go about things and how, how to get scale from distribution and so on. So to me, I mean, it's like Uber is doing basically, like mm. go city by city. But, but to me, that's, that to find uh, you know, the market and, and not make it too big uh, is, is something that I think you need to think a lot more about being European and being American in that you don't have the whole market. Mm. So but I think the, you, so, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I was going to say this sounds like this was the IZL expansion strategy that yeah. start in Sweden and move out. Was that similar for ClickTech or did you use a different model? You mean ex starting in Sweden? Expansion, yeah, when you were thinking about yeah, expanding. I, mean, and I think the difference between ClickTech and, uh, and iSettle is that we expanded to more countries. Mm. So when I left the company uh, after uh, 10 years in early 2010. 
we had customers in more than 100 countries around the globe and all continents. The, the joke is we had customers on all continents uh, with the exception of Antarctica. So, but uh, you know, you can't sell a lot to the, the, uh, the uh, penguins, I guess. The, uh, but what I, what I was about to say is that I think uh, uh, an advantage that you have as a European uh, company is that, you know, obviously, you keep, European companies make a lot of stupid mistakes in the US and it's very hard to get into that market because Europeans don't realize how big the difference is in culture between Europe and the US. But at the same time, the American companies make a lot of stupid mistakes in Europe too. Mm -hmm. And they make a lot of stupid mistakes in Latin America and Asia and, and Australia and what have you. So, and I think it's easier for, for a European company to, to penetrate Latin America, for instance, or you know, yeah, whatever, Asia or Australia or what have you, because that's, um, the, uh, I think the uh, culture that we come from resonates much better with most countries in the world. There's a couple of countries that are truly different, so United States is one. Uh, I, would, I would rank China as one that's very different too. Japan is obviously also very different. Most other countries that I've come to have more things in common with, uh, with European countries than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than things that uh, differ. It's interesting. Can you also all speak about the pace of expansion? How do you gauge how fast or how slow it's Sounds like it was a critical piece of the business, but I mean, we we had lots of discussions because Laurel thought we were we had two high ambitions in number of countries that we were going to go after and so on. And you know, in retrospect, she was right. You know, <laughs> uh, I think so. Oh, really? <laughs> I never told her then, but but uh, you know, I, so, I thought so too, Magnus. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know, I, to really make it in a country and and uh, or in a city and then expand is so much more important to get the real position. Mm -hmm where you start, you fully understand the, the, the opportunities mm -hmm. that exist in each country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Market that we are addressing is huge, you know, so, so there is no need to go to mm -hmm. 50 countries immediately. Now, you know, with being part of PayPal, we have mm -hmm. uh, over, over, uh, you know, going forward, I guess we will have lots of opportunities to go to new markets that we're not in today. And it will be cheaper for us to do that than if we were to do it alone. But generally speaking, finding product market fit and really penetrate a market much more important than taking 10 markets and doing a half-hearted job. Mm. Did you want to add I just wanted to chip in because most companies that I see make such stupid mistakes when it comes to market penetration. They, you know, obviously when, I mean, it would be sort of natural when you, if you see a multi-billion dollar opportunity that your, your instincts would tell you to go out and try to be everywhere as soon as you ever can, nothing could be more wrong. Hmm. You have to start the other way around. So you have to, when you start, you're a small unknown company with a very weak brand name. The first thing you have to do is define a piece of the market that is small enough for you to dominate in 12 months. Uh, and that's tough because it's a, it's a, it's a mental exercise that, uh, that we don't seem to be built for. But if you do that and you focus on that market and you really, really win and dominate that market, you will find that it's much easier to expand and then sort of build the circles like you, uh, if you peel the onion the, uh, the, in the reverse. Is that the right term? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a question from the audience. I'm going to read it quickly because we're almost out of time. Can we expect a higher growth rate of companies with billion dollar potential comparing to the US with regulations like GDPR? I think the point is, do the regulations gonna impede growth potentially in Europe? Or maybe it's an advantage? <laughs> quick answer. <laughs> well, quick answer to me is I don't think it actually uh, makes life more difficult. You know? okay. I think we have just the same possibilities to grow the business anyhow. And actually, if you, if you master it, you will actually have a barrier of entry from others to come in. Any, we've 20 seconds. Any other, <laughs> any other I don't layers think on that? The, uh, I, think, I don't think it's about GDP, GDPR or regulations. I think if you have a large market opportunity and, and you have a unique position on that market, it's much more about your own ability to, to penetrate the market and build your organization. Mm. Last thoughts? 
I think that's right. It depends on the timing of the market. I mean, some companies have the luxury of time and don't have to go that fast. Just eat in its early days, and 2000 was like that. Um, on the other hand, I think Isettel needed to run, I mean, you had to penetrate your markets, but you needed yeah. to get into a number of them fast because you had competitors. So I think it depends on the, and then yeah. software, you've got to be super careful because I think if you go from wherever, Paris or Frankfurt to the US, probably that's what you should do in year one and not try to go to three or four countries because it'd be really hard to get the sales enablement, et cetera, right. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, company by company, I, I, you shouldn't worry about regulation. That's not the, that's not the defining point. Excellent. Well, we're out of time, so I'll have to say thank you, although I would love to keep listening. Really appreciate the, the authenticity and the real world stories. I'm speaking on behalf of the audience. I'm sure they appreciated it too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.